Good morning and a very warm welcome. My name is Olivia sundberg Diaz. I am a policy analyst at the European Policy Centre and I'm very pleased to welcome you at this event uh, titled Return and Readmission After the New Pact. We're very happy to be holding this event in the framework of the MEDAM project, the Mercator Dialogue on Asylum and Migration, of which the EPC is a part, together with the Kiel Institute for the World Economy and the Migration Policy Centre in Florence, and which is kindly supported by Stiftung Mercator. A key question that is the focus of the MEDAM project is how to build a cooperation on migration between the EU and Africa that is effective and mutually beneficial. Today's discussion is the second in a series of three MEDAM events looking precisely at the future of this partnership. This autumn has been an eventful one. We have in the background the COVID-19 pandemic, the recent publication of the European Commission's new pact on migration and asylum, as well as the upcoming EU-AU summit, which was recently postponed to 2021. All of these developments raise new and challenging questions about the future of migration cooperation. So we thought this would be an ideal time to reflect on where to take this crucial partnership. The past event we held looked at labour migration and the next one on the 4th of November will focus on resettlement and today we want to look at return and readmission. Our main question that we want to look at today is how can an effective, mutually beneficial and human rights compliant migration cooperation be advanced and what role do return and readmission play in this future partnership between the EU and Africa? The new pact on migration and asylum may of course have a significant impact on return and readmission cooperation, which we will unpack today of course. Are these proposals compatible with African states' interests and priorities relating to migration? What can the EU and European actors do to better incorporate African realities and perspectives into this partnership? And finally, EU return policies have faced a number of serious challenges over the past few years. These include human rights risks for returnees, issues concerning the effectiveness of return, as well as complex dynamics relating to the loss of remittances or democratic legitimacy for readmitting states. We shouldn't lose sight of these challenges and we should ask how to address them also in the context of the new pact and COVID-19 further complicating returns in the near future. To answer these questions, we are joined today by an extremely qualified panel. We are uh, very happy to welcome Her Excellency Ambassador Tenning Bajete, who is the ambassador of the Gambia to the EU. Welcome and thank you for your time, Madam Ambassador. We have Francisco Gatelu Mezquiriz, who is the head of the Irregular Migration and Return Policy Unit at the European Commission. Thank you for joining us. We Good have Kwaku Arhin Sam, who is the director at the Friedensau Institute for Evaluation at the Friedensau Adventist University. Welcome. And lastly, we have Victoria Rietig, the head of the migration program at the German Council of Foreign Relations, DGAP. Thank you all so much for making the time to join us today. And just as a final uh, note on housekeeping before we start, uh, all <laughs> panelists will be speaking for about six to eight minutes. After these interventions, we will of course have an opportunity for Q&A. You can write your questions at any time in the Q&A box. Um, and you can also press the raise hand button if you would like to raise the questions to your speakers yourself. Please do make your questions as concise as possible. It's going to make my job a little bit easier. Um, and just to say, we're expecting around 150 participants. So we do count on many of your contributions. I'll leave it at that. Um, all of this said, I am very pleased to kick off the discussion today. Um, and to start, we're very honored to welcome our first speaker today, Ambassador <coughs> Kenning Bajete. We are delighted to open the discussion with your longstanding expertise uh, and your extremely insightful perspective from the Gambia. Madam Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you, Olivia. Very good morning to you and to my fellow panelists and all participants in this virtual event. Let me firstly extend my deep appreciation to the EPC for inviting me to share my views on the important dialogue on return and readmission following the release of the EU's new pact on migration and asylum. The fact that we are holding this event virtually is testimony that we live in very unusual and difficult times, forcing all of us to reevaluate our priorities, both at the national and global levels. In this regard, we appreciate the efforts of the European Union in assisting African countries to deal with the pandemic through its emergency response programs. The reality is that the pandemic has already had a devastating impact on our fragile economies, and this must be taken into account on any policy development, including in the area of migration management and specifically on return and readmission. 
with specific reference to the Gambia, we are currently going through a political and democratic transformation process since the elections of 2016 and the removal of the 22-year-old dictatorial regime. The new government has indeed embarked on establishing the necessary transitional justice systems, as well as structural reforms to rebuild our democratic institutions. These are still ongoing. However, due to the poor state of the economy and social infrastructure, these structural reforms have to be given equal priority with the rebuilding of the economy. For an LBC like the Gambia, this is no easy task. We appreciate the partnership and support the European Union provided in our resource mobilization efforts towards the implementation of our national development plan. The discussion on migration, return, readmission, and reintegration has to take these factors into consideration as this determines whether we would have a successful return and readmission program or not. If the push factors are still in existence and there are very little incentives for return, we would continue to experience irregular migration as returnees attempt to leave our countries again. But, um, Madam Moderator, Africa is the EU's closest neighbor and the two continents have shared a long-standing collaboration at continent to continent level and also between member states. Such collaboration had yielded positive results in both continents in many areas, including in trade, economic cooperation, and partnership cooperation in global affairs. We are happy to see that the new commission has indeed prioritized collaboration with Africa in its program. This has been demonstrated through high level visits, including the recent visit of the Vice President and High Representative Joseph Borrell to Addis Ababa. Thus, for Africa, the policies on migration and asylum have always been oriented towards reducing poverty and engendering development through job creation to reduce the push factors. That is a more holistic approach to the migration dialogue. The EU, on the other hand, places greater focus on border control and, and management for return and readmission. We also see that the new pact is more focused on border management. Even though it talks about the external dimension, that is cooperation with third countries, it is my belief that there is reduced focus on development programs that would reduce poverty and create jobs. There is also less focus on opening legal pathways for migration. This is now being linked to performance on returns and readmission, therefore placing this as a conditionality for further development cooperation. We are equally concerned that there will be less efforts at protection of migrants along the routes, especially in Libya. We do know that the Africa, EU and the UN task force has registered some success in this area through voluntary returns and evacuations. However, a lot more needs to be done to protect the thousands of migrants that are stranded in Libya under very difficult conditions and most of them in the hands of traffickers. The mandatory quick screening at the southern borders, which the EU hopes to do within five days, might not prioritize the human rights, safety, and dignity of migrants. We are hoping that the upcoming African Union, European Union Summit in 2021 would focus on implementation of the joint programs and policies, including the joint Africa-EU strategy, which is anchored on Agenda 2063, on, uh, on the Africa we want, and also on the sustainable development goals with the principle of leaving no one behind. We are hoping that it would also deepen economic cooperation through investments, green jobs and growth, as well as fair trade. We also believe that it would give priority and support to the new continental free trade agreement, which is also anchored on the free movement protocol to support, support labor migration within Africa. Our partnership must, must also help mitigate the economic impact of COVID-19, including where possible debt relief or cancellation, increase solidarity to fighting COVID-19, including the development and distribution of vaccines and support in strengthening health systems. Support to the new OACPS EU post cotonou partnership agreement, which is a legally binding agreement geared towards a holistic and longer term and more sustainable partnership. Specifically, migration policies at both ends must be in line 
with the African Union's theme of silencing the guns, creating a conducive conditions for Africa's development. We believe that armed conflict is a major contributor to forced displacement and migration. The joint policies must be people focused and geared towards the protection and welfare of young people for sustainable development. There are also other areas like um, diaspora engagements, remittances, opening up legal pathways to travel and not making these as a precondition for how well we do on the returns area. We believe in a sense that um, the four, first four pillars of the Joint Valencia Action Plan, which includes addressing the root causes of regular migration, should also um, um, attract equal attention. The EU needs to con take into consideration the political implications of forced returns on very fragile democratic systems in countries like the Gambia. The backlash from forced returns and readmission without the necessary support mechanisms in the destination countries can be even more difficult to manage. In the Gambia, we have had incidents where returnees took to the streets demonstrating against the manner in which they were forcefully returned, as well as the lack of proper reception facilities upon the arrival, even though these were promised prior to their returns. Families have also threatened to demonstrate if government does not intervene to put a halt to subsequent arrivals. For a country that transitioned from dictatorship largely through the efforts of Gambians in the diaspora, mostly young people, this has helped to erode the confidence that young people have in the new government as they felt betrayed. A new national migration policy is being finalized. However, the reality is that capacity constraints hinder us from working at the pace at which the EU expects us to. I would conclude by saying that irregular migration is a concern for both continents. Africa continues to lose its young people, many of whom continue to lose their lives in their bid to seek opportunities in Europe. Europe finds itself dealing with levels of mig migrants that it's not able to handle. Therefore, we need to jointly develop policies and programs that would enable us to arrive at win-win solutions and commit to these programs. The unified EU approach is a step in the right direction, but we believe that the focus on returns might undermine the very outcomes that we are trying to achieve. I will stop here for now, Madam Moderator, and um, look forward for, to further discussion on this issue. Madam Ambassador, thank you very much uh, for your excellent observations. Um, you have given us a very rich outline of the trends in migration cooperation and areas, very important areas, in which closer cooperation and shared interests could be strengthened further. You've also outlined the importance of sustainable return, also in the context of development um, and in the context of tackling uh, conflicts and the theme of silencing the guns uh, of the African Union. So I think these are extremely valuable observations and thank you as well for linking it to the context of the Gambia, which is of course extremely important. So thank you very much uh, for starting the discussion on that note. Um, next, I am delighted uh, to welcome Mr. Francisco Gacelumetkiri. Given your role as head of the Irregular Migration and Return Policy Unit, we'd be very mm -hmm. grateful if you could, uh, well, that you could join us today and we'd be very grateful to hear your insights on how policies and cooperation in this area may look going forward. So thank you very much. The floor is yours. It is a pleasure to be here today. Good morning to everyone. Good morning, of course, to you, Olivia, to the Her Excellency and as well Mr. Arhin and Mrs. Ritik. So it's a pleasure, of course, to share this panel with, uh, with you and an honor as well. And I was listening, of course, very attentively to the remarks by the ambassador, and I found them, of course, extremely interesting. Uh, I will just say, you know, we'll use four or five minutes, as you said, to explain a little bit what the Commission has presented in the new pact. And I will just focus, you know, a, a little more precisely, of course, on the external side of this uh, migration pact. Uh, in relation, of course, to returns and readmission, which is the topic of, of today's uh, meeting. Um, the Commission in the Pact, I think, uh, has tried, tried and I think succeeded this time to present a real comprehensive approach. It's a word we use a lot, but I think in this case, in the case of migration, it is fundamental in case uh, we want to succeed in managing migration properly. This comprehensive approach includes both the internal aspects and external aspects, and we have actually made sure as well that these uh, interlinkages between both dimensions are clearly stated in our in the legislative proposals and communication we presented uh, i will not of course go through all the details of the pact because it is a vast 
uh, you know, I think this uh, a vast uh, number of uh, pieces of legislation and communications. But there you can see that we have uh, really um, addressed all the aspects, you know, from of the migration routes, if you want. We are looking, of course, at working with, with third countries in mutually and win-win partnerships. Uh, we are also thinking and working together with third countries as well on fighting against irregular migration and anti-smuggling, which I think, as the ambassador said, it is a common endeavor and something of uh, mutual concern. Of course, the smuggling and exploitation of, of migrants along the, the routes uh, to arrive eventually regularly in Europe. And of course, we have also looked at, uh, let's say, the main preoccupation of the EU, which is as well to provide protection to those in need of protection. This, of course, still the cornerstone of, migra of our migration policy. We have done, uh, presented a number of uh, legislative proposals which link better uh, how to deal with protection and as well how to deal with those who do not necessarily at the end of the process uh, deserve international protection. And this, of course, with the objective of ensuring and guaranteeing that those who need to be protected really receive, of course, protection as soon as possible and according to the necessary standards. So we have tried to uh, really you know, have proposed a holistic approach to asylum and returns in a way that both sides of the of the equation work properly as far as the commissions uh, and member states procedures and processes are concerned. Uh, then um, I think uh, in the area of uh, we also have addressed, by the way, you know how to organize better search and rescue operations, how also to guarantee that uh, these operations are protected by international law, uh, which is also very important in terms of saving lives, of course, and making sure that the risks are minimized as possible, as much as possible, which is, I think, again, a common and mutual interest of um, third countries and the EU. Uh, we have also, as you know, in this context, an issue which has been of, uh, of uh, high level of discussion in the EU, um, make sure that within the EU as well, the responsibility and solidarity aspects are well balanced. And in that context, indeed, returns take now a more important role than before, because obviously we have realized that as opposed to the 2015 and 16 years, the majority of people arriving into the EU irregularly, or the majority of people nevertheless, <clears throat> do not deserve protection. We're talking about one third, two thirds at the moment of people who deserve protection, while two thirds should uh, be returned. Um, one uh, weak leg, if you want, of our migration policy to date has been the return uh, area uh, for different reasons. I think there are internal problems and as well uh, the cooperation with third countries. Um, internal issues uh, have to be improved and I think uh, the procedures will be improved following the adoption of the pact, as I said, because we have linked better asylum and, and return rules. Uh, we have also presented a request to the return directive. So all, thing, all this, I think, will move towards an improvement of the internal side. We have also presented a return coordinator who will actually make sure that member states learn from each other and exchange best practices so that actually they can be more effective as well in the stages in preparation of return. That, that's, that's very clear as well. And a high level network that will also help in this. But now, focusing for the next minute or minute and a half on the external side, um, there, uh, I think, in line with what the ambassador was saying, we are proposing a number of interesting things. In any event, we have understood, and I think our partners as well, African partners have understood as well, that we need to cooperate better here. This is very clear. We cannot do returns, obviously, without the readmission side working well. And beyond the fact that readmission, of course, is an international obligation, as the ambassador said, there are a number of limitations, political limitations and socioeconomic limitations that, of course, do not make necessary uh, this international obligation to be implemented straightforwardly. So, of course, with the Gambia, we have established a good partnership in the past in terms of cooperation, as the ambassador said, has underlined a number of areas where the EU has provided support and has worked with the Gambia. Uh, but in the area of returns, I think it's an area where I think the ambassador will also recognize we can improve uh, uh, for sure. Um, but, you know, for improvement, we are proposing a number of things. One of them is, I think, uh, an issue that the ambassador was pointing out, which is the readmission and reintegration support. So one of the deliverables of the pact will be a new strategy on reintegration and voluntary returns. And the strategy usually is, first of all, uh, equivalent of good thinking, but sometimes also is the equivalent of non-operational <laughs> results, which is not the case. In this case, what we do is to indeed use uh, development funding as well as the migration funding to develop, to expand the number of voluntary returns. Why? Because the voluntary returns are indeed 
the best way of increasing and improving the quality of returns to make them more sustainable and as well to make them more acceptable. Uh, and second, as well, we are going to support this with a more systematic support of, on reintegration of those returnees post arrival. And for this, of course, need, we need funding. That's why the INDICI, so in the ICI development, development instrument, includes 10% uh, of funding as well for migration. Uh, certainly, that will be one of the points of focus. Uh, support for integration support. So we need to offer opportunities and economic opportunities to those uh, returning as well. This, of course, is not the only way. So forced returns and compulsory returns, whatever you want to call them, will continue because they're also a necessary side of sustainable uh, returns. Um, but then, of course, as I said, is my final point. This would be in the context of overall cooperation and partnerships with, <clears throat> with third countries. It is true that the pact includes as well um, the activation of positive or negative visa measures and other measures as well to support readmission uh, cooperation. But this also to be seen always in the framework of overall, as the ambassador said, win-win in mutual, mutually supportive uh, partnerships. I think I stop here, uh, Olivia, because I think the best thing is to receive questions and answers and of course to give the opportunity to Mr. Arhin and Mrs. Riti to go on. Thank you, Olivia. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Francisco, for this extremely valuable overview of some of the key measures in the new pact. It's a complex and very comprehensive package, so of course we don't expect you to outline it all in six minutes. Um, but I think you've given us a, a very valuable overview of some of the key measures in terms of return, part of the overarching principles in terms of the focus on voluntary returns and reintegration support um, that I think is, is a very valuable contribution, so thank you very much for that. Uh, next, I am very happy to welcome Dr. Kwaku Arhin Sam. Uh, Kwaku, you've written extensively on return, not to mention your work on returnee uh, reintegration on the ground. Uh, so we're very happy to count on your perspective today. Um, and I think it's extremely relevant to the discussion. So without any further delay, happy to hand over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Madam uh, Ambassador and uh, Commissioner. Uh, thank you for, for, for what you've presented so far. And I, I share uh, a lot of the things you, 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 you mentioned very well. And uh, however, I, I, I just want to take a look at uh, how this new pact is viewed by civil servants and administrators who get this document in front of them uh, and what they mean out of it. So, so I would just start by First of all, the aspect of, of, of uh, keeping migrant in the, in the country of origin um, is gonna be looked at very well. That's, that's the first part. How is it gonna be, uh, what is the process? How, how can that be materialized on the ground to, to keep migrants in the home country? Uh, actually, uh, the pact uh, is, is very extensive on that part when it comes to uh, keeping migrants home. Uh, but also on the other part, what we are discussing now, return and, and reintegration. Uh, I think most uh, uh, civil servants working on migration in many African uh, uh, countries will be looking at who is doing what within the EU itself because the new pact uh, is sort of like giving the bully the control to now be the police. When, when the idea and the suggestion coming from countries that are not uh, uh, very, very lenient towards migrants, actually having to contribute towards return in, effort, in terms of personnel or resources in any other way. I think from this angle, it's a very, it's like a win situation for the extreme anti-migrant uh, 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 EU member states. And that is where a lot of people are going to look at what is actually going to happen when these return, uh, returns are actually put into force. We have seen issues of abuse of migrants. We, 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 we have heard and, 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 and followed research about all these that are happening to migrants in some of these countries like Poland, Hungary, and the rest. Now, if these are the ones going to, 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 to play active role in return because they are not considering the solidarity process of taking in migrants and refugees, then we are looking forward to see how this is going to operationalize. Then the security and safety of migrants has to come into question because one thing also that many uh, uh, African countries might be looking at is 
uh, 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 what is EU going to do? And we have to be very careful here because the actions of the EU might be emboldening other, uh, other, other governments somewhere. When they see migrant uh, uh, abuse, and, uh, then the legitimacy or the, the moral rights of the EU to even come and tell uh, uh, African countries to respect human rights and all this, that moral fiber is going to go down. So we are looking at how these returns, the first four returns are going to take place. Now, we are talking about also a comprehensive uh, uh, migration uh, 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 approach or policy. Let us look at the infrastructures of these countries that the, the new part actually is insisting on return to go to. When they go back home to these infrastructure, you can give a person millions of cities or willfully return in the millions of, of euros, whatever currency you give. But if the infrastructure is not there, if the system is not really robust to even invest that money in it, it will go down the drain. And again, we see what would this money be spent on? What would these reintegration and return uh, 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 packages spent on? It will be spent on commodities coming from the EU as well. It will be spent on 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 on, on uh, activities that are organized by by the EU and member state uh, 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 organizations themselves as well. So we we have seen in the past all these things building up where organizations and partners of the EU are actually the ones who benefit from these return uh, initiatives. And we have to be very uh, realistic here. The, 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 the budget constraints of uh, organizations, IOM and others who are implementing these policies and these uh, 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 readmission projects, how much does it really go to the projects themselves, apart from paying the staffs and all the other uh, 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 other other stuff that are involved as well. I mean, we have to be realistic about this reintegration return. And mind you, also African countries government have to sit up. I, when I when I see the pack, I'm not only talking about the civil servants, but uh, politicians need to, to sit up. We have to start creating the environment that people and the youth will stay back. Into. When the ambassador was talking, uh, uh, she talked about the, the, the structures that, for example, Gambia is putting in place and, and the structures that are being built. But I would say it's it's quite slow. It's, it's a slow process. I know the challenges that are there, but also the commitment seems to be going down. Sometimes when we are talking about this, the political environment seems to raise up and come up. But when no one is talking about it, it goes down again. African government, we have a responsibility towards our citizen. And it is true, the European partners might think that uh, African government are encouraging, encouraging it. No, it's not like that. They are also very particular about irregular migration. However, the focus on return and remittances shouldn't be the key, uh, a policy framework for African government, because remittances are out of people's own. It's not, they are not forced. If they are not bringing remittances, what will happen to the economy? So the economy should find something else. And these are the, 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 the key lines that African government can take from this pact as well. The pact is very European centered. Again, uh, I see it that way because, and the Europeans themselves are having even issues to accept and agree on this pact. So African government needs to sit up and take situations into their own hands. And if returns are going to happen and the money is going to come in or, or financial support to build infrastructures, these should be well, well managed. We can't continue doing the same thing we do over and over again. Even though this pact is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a better improvement from the previous one, there are still aspects on concerns about this pact, how it's gonna be implemented. And for this to go on, government in on the continent of Africa needs to also sit up and think of how to take the situation in their own hands. People are dying, going back or returning them is not just the solution. Thank you. Sako, thank you very much uh, for that extremely insightful contribution. Um, you've raised concerns that are 
perhaps too rarely discussed in terms of legitimacy and, and the moral fiber and the broader impact that EU policies can have far beyond the continent itself. You've also raised extremely pertinent questions about how return and reintegration initiatives don't always have the necessary impact or the proper management on the ground. I think it's very clear from your contribution that it's a far more complex um, <clears throat> policy sphere to manage uh, than we sometimes pretend that it is when we're talking about it and that it cannot be disentangled from a lot of uh, broader very complex questions so thanks a lot for that um, I think that's very insightful um, next and for our final speaker we will be moving on to Miss Victoria Ritik um, Victoria you have of course also worked extensively on this topic including on return and reintegration on the effectiveness of return particularly within the German context um, as well as EU Africa cooperation on migration more broadly so I'm delighted to hand over to you in just a moment. Before that, just a reminder to all participants that after this contribution, we will be moving over to Q&A. Um, so please continue writing your questions in the Q&A box or raise your hands, um, and you will have an opportunity to raise the questions to the speakers yourselves. Thank you very much. Victoria, over to you. Thanks a lot, Olivia, and thank you very much for including me in this panel. Um, so much has already been covered by um, my three co-panelists that I'm going to cut quite a lot of what I was planning to say. That is a good thing. Um, I was asked to speak to three things. One is what is the likely impact of the pact on return and readmissions going to be. Two, what are the actual challenges in return? Why are returns actually so hard? And three, so what should we do about it? How can we establish a mutually beneficial partnership between Europe and uh, countries of origin and transit? Um, on the first point, what's the likely impact? Of course, we all know that we don't know because a lot of the details of the pact or of the proposal are still uh, very much unclear and to be determined. Of course, the negotiations are still going to happen and it might the proposal as it stands today might change substantially. So what we can say right now is that the impact will hinge on these next steps, but also on the answers that will be found during those next steps um, to some crucial questions that are still there and that are very opaque so far. I'll just focus on two questions that are absolutely unclear. One is how are the sponsorship, um, the return sponsorships actually going to work in practice? I'll give you an example. If, for instance, Afghans arrive in Italy and Hungary decides to take up uh, return sponsorship of those Afghans there, so how is that actually going to work in practice? Um, how would uh, Hungary take up, what does it mean when Hungary takes up the responsibility for these people? Um, will Hungary relocate them to Hungary um, uh, while, um, while it's trying to make the returns happen to Afghanistan? How will Hungary negotiate with Afghanistan? How will it convince Afghanistan to take these people back? Um, and of course, what happens if uh, Hungary does not manage to return these people within the eight months? Will they then be stuck in Hungary? Will they be stuck in Italy? Um, whose laws are going to apply in case of human rights breaches? All of these are open questions. The other open question is, of course, what will countries of origin actually say? Um, we have a saying in German that is to make the bill without the waiter, meaning to make a decision without taking the most important partner into account. And it seems that the Commission has developed this new pact in cooperation with the member states, but less so in uh, cooperation with the relevant countries of origin. Um, perhaps Mr. Castello Mescuris can, uh, can give some insights on in how far um, other countries were involved in this process. Um, so the what are the challenges to return so why are returns so difficult I could now of course give you a long list of reasons and a lot of these reasons have already been mentioned but lists usually don't stick so instead I would like to propose an image to you of what I call the return machine which consists of three parts really um, and when you propose an image as a think tanker, of course, uh, you, what you do is you go to your son's room while he's asleep and you steal his crayons and then you paint something. Um, so I painted something for you, um, which simply shows the three parts of the return machine. You have the return, you have the origin country and you have the host country. Um, when my son looked at this, he said, why are you drawing the coronavirus? So let me assure you, it's not the coronavirus. It's supposed to be the wheels of the machine. And if your reaction to this image is, I don't need an image to imagine three parts of a machine, you might need it though in the next picture. Because the point of this picture here is simply that this machine only works if the three parts cooperate. But the question is, what happens when some of these parts stop working and they're either unwilling or unable to work together? And the answer is the machine will still continue to work, but, in, but with more creaks and only for certain types of returns. So this is the other image that I drew. 
And this one simply is meant to show what happens when some of the parts of the machine don't work and you don't have the buy-in of those parts. Um, let's start with the easy one. So if the returnee and the origin country are all in agreement, what you have is a self-organized return. And that's basically your daily returns that happens out of the public eye and without any problems in every day. Now, if, and you don't need the buy-in obviously of the host country for that. If you have the buy-in of the returnee and the host country together, then you have assisted voluntary return. You don't necessarily need the origin country for that. It would be useful to have it, of course, especially for giving reintegration support afterwards, but you don't need it technically, right? So this can be, uh, just these two parts can work together. And the same applies for the third type of return, which is when origin country and host country work together, even against the will of the returnee, and then you have deportations, okay? So I drew this picture not just to show you that my decision not to pursue an art degree was the right one, but really to make clear and drive home one point, and that is that if the return system is broken, it is rarely the fault of one of these parts of the machine. Our debate oftentimes seeks fault with one part of these machines. You have a lot of politicians that talk about countries of origin not being willing to cooperate or returnees not, um, not willing to cooperate. But of course, that is a, a bit of a shortened, that's a bit too simplistic a view because usually the problem lies with all three parts. So you have to nudge all three parts to get things done. And the reasons why some of these um, uh, parts of the machine aren't willing to cooperate are, of course, simple, you know, simple. We've heard a lot of these. The returnees might not be willing to go, so they might abscond or they might not be able to get their ID documents in order. Uh, origin countries might not be willing or able to take people back. We've heard that from the ambassador um, and other speakers, of course, that this puts a lot of pressure, especially on young democracies, um, that the reintegration infrastructure and reception infrastructure might be very limited. Thank you, Kwaku, for mentioning also the, the role that the countries themselves have in playing you know, to, uh, in, in building up these systems. Um, and, uh, and of course, they rely on remittances, and that, uh, you know, are all reasons why the why this part of the machine might not be willing to cooperate. But when it comes to the host country, we do agree that there is a great willingness to do returns, but actually the ability to do returns is quite limited in European countries, and that goes for both the individual member states level and for the EU level. Germany's return system is case in point. It is extremely fragmented, it is extremely intransparent, and it is in fact unfair. Um, so a lot of the problems in uh, not being able to effectively return people are homemade in Germany. And the same goes for the European Union, which wants to cooperate on returns, but often when it comes to the practical implementation, um, fails to do so in part because there's very different interests there. So last point here, if Europe wants to make these returns work, uh, work it, it has to nudge the three parts of the system. So it has to offer things to the returnees. Um, it has to fix its own return systems and it has to work towards functioning partnership with countries of origin. And that brings me to the last point, which is how do we get to that mutually beneficial partnership? We have, we keep reading the same language, right? We want win-wins, we want mutual trust, we want uh, benefits, a relationship on eye level. We read that in the MOUs, in the joint statements and declarations, etc. But as soon as we move away from the desirable rhetoric into the pragmatic reality, we of course know that that's where opinions diverge and where the agreement ends and where the discussion on conditionality starts that a lot of the speakers have already spoken about. So let me just, in very broad strokes, um, paint the two opposing positions here on conditionality. Some say a functioning partnership needs uh, incentives, but never threats. So EU countries should offer preferential visa access, um, legal pathways, financial support through development aid, but never actually threats because sanctions might hurt more than help and will uh, have a negative impact on the development of the country. That view, of course, is legitimate, but it misses a few facts. It misses the fact that sometimes there are examples when sanctions have actually increased the return numbers. It misses the fact that the threat of sanctions might be useful to have in your negotiation toolbox, even if you don't use the sanction itself. So these are some things that complicate that view. But the same is true for the other side, right? The others say, well, why should the EU have to incentivize countries to take their people back if that is a duty they have anyways under international law, right? Taking their citizens back. So the EU should in fact not use carrots, but just use sticks. It should um, withhold visas, it should channel development aid to other countries that are more willing to cooperate and also trade more with countries that are willing to cooperate. And that view, again, is also coherent and not illegitimate, but it also misses a few crucial facts, namely, 
one, EU sticks aren't all that scary anymore. If the EU decides to withhold development aid, there are other countries that might be willing to uh, give it instead, perhaps with fewer strings attached. China and Russia come to mind. Um, sanctions, of course, do risk the long-term deterioration of partnerships that are difficult already. And uh, last but not least, it, it runs against the EU's beloved self-image of a benign force rather than a bully. So some of us now might feel drawn to one side or the other. Um, but I fear that at this stage, where we are drawn to is more due to our own moral and political beliefs and less to hard evidence. Because the sad truth about conditionality is that we have a lot of debate around it, but a lot less evidence. A lot of it is anecdotal. A lot of it is not public. Um, so my the very last thing I'll say is that to really um, continue this discussion in a useful manner, what we need is better evidence on where and under which conditions positive incentives and negative sanctions actually have what impact on return numbers on development and on other factors. And once we have that, that would actually enable us to, um, to understand the real life effects and the trade-offs of these things, as opposed to just the theoretical ones that we keep discussing. And very last sentence, that hopefully then would enable us to move from the rather entrenched conversation of whether to use conditionality to a more useful um, conversation about how and under which circumstances to use it and what trade-offs to expect. Thanks. Thank you, Victoria. Um, you have managed to touch in quite some depth on a range of very complex uh, policy debates in very little time, so I commend you for that. Um, thank you for the very instructive overview of the different barriers to return and how they may interact with each other. I think this raises, among others, a lot of very interesting questions about the new pact uh, and whether uh, you know, that runs similar risks of having policies rely very heavily on each other without a clear answer of what happens if one of those elements fails. Um, so something that indeed we can discuss in more detail later. Um, I'm also very grateful for your comments on conditionality. Um, I think you're absolutely right that it's it's a debate that uh, requires a lot more information to be able to have informed opinions um, about it. And I think that uh, you've given us some very good advice going forward. So thank you for that. Um, and I think that's an excellent note on which to move to our Q&A session. Um, we have already had quite a few questions, um, so I'll give the people who asked them a chance to read them out themselves if they would like to. Um, starting perhaps with Madeline Martin. Uh, Madeline, you asked a question. Uh, would you like to read it out? You are muted, but you can unmute yourself. Hi, Madeline. I think we hear you. No, we do not. Okay. Um, perhaps, uh, Madeline, we'll come back to you. Josephine Liebel, you wanted to ask a question? Josephine? Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes, now we hear you. Wonderful. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Josephine Liebel. I work for ECRE. I want to thank all uh, the panelists for their very insightful contributions. I really enjoyed uh, listening to all of you. I have one question to all panelists, and it's whether you could comment on the negotiations of the post-Cotonou framework, which are currently underway, um, and on the EU's insistence on increased commitments regarding readmission in a quite prescriptive manner, as I understand, and how that may impact on the um, EU's ambition to create win-win partnerships with African countries. So that's... Um, a question um, to all to all panelists, and then I had one question specifically to the uh, European um, Commission. Um, um, I'm aware that uh, the European Commission is currently preparing an assessment of the levels of cooperation on readmission for, I think it's over 30 um, third countries, which may then result in positive or negative visa measures as per the revised visa code, and I think that was mentioned um, by a couple of speakers already. Um, and I was wondering to what extent um, does such an assessment take into consideration the challenges that are faced by third country governments and societies related to readmission, which um, we have heard the ambassador talk about um, in her statement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, somebody else who asked a question is Jessica Mullins. Jessica, would you like to raise your question? Hi, um, thank you everyone. Uh, that's amazing. I'm in Australia at the moment, so it was very much well worth staying back at work. So thank you so much. Um, 
My question is with regards to the human rights implications of returns. So um, to the whole panel, I was wondering whether or not what your perspective was, sorry, I was wondering what your perspective was on the concerns that this pact may further exacerbate human rights abuses resultant from returning refugees. So for example, in Libya, there are reports that smugglers are losing income due to the EU's externalisation policies, and then they are subsequently auctioning migrants off in the slave trade, forcing them into labour to pay off perceived debts, etc. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Jessica. Uh, and we have another question from Diana, uh, Diana Eyring, if you'd like to uh, raise your question. Thank you very much. I just had a quick question for Francisco Gastero Mesquiz on um, um, on the assisted voluntary return um, component, because I think you mentioned before that one important part of this um, will be to increase, increase uptake of, of assisted voluntary returns. And so I wanted to understand perhaps in more concrete terms um, how the EU envisages this to, to happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, and lastly, Madeline, would you like to try again to raise your question? Okay, it doesn't seem to work, uh, so I'll read it out. Uh, Madeline's question was also for Mr. Mithkiri, uh, which is, which difficulties um, are there to the implementation of readmission agreements by EU member states that the Commission has identified, uh, presumably in, in the context of the new pact, but also more broadly? Uh, so we'll leave it with this round of questions for now, but of course we'll come back for more. Um, let's go back to the panel, starting with Madam Ambassador, if you'd like to start. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Olivia. And um, I think the question from Josephine was regarding uh, the OECPS EU partnership um, negotiations that is um, ongoing at the moment. And um, she's right in the sense that um, migration and specifically the issue of return and the admission is one of the most difficult areas that we're, we're um, um, nego still negotiating on. And uh, principally because of the issues that we're being, uh, that are being raised now, the um, views that the OECPS member states have on the way and manner in which uh, migration, especially return and readmission, needs to be viewed vis-a-vis -vis the EU way of um, focusing on return and readmission. So um, I would not discuss the details of um, the agreements. Like I said, it's still being um, negotiated, but we are hoping that whatever outcome we arrive at at the end of the day, would take on board our interests and concerns and um, at least make sure that you know it's a long-term partnership and um, it's legally binding to make sure that um, it does not it leads to the desired outcome in terms of reducing the numbers coming in illegally as well as um, protection of um, migrants that are already in Europe and um, also in um, transit countries like Libya. This has always been our contention. The focus has always been how many people are being returned, which is not a very good yardstick of um, assessing how the returns policies are being implemented. Because, for example, if I take the Gambia, when we transitioned to a democracy, there were a lot of requests for you know, voluntary returns to the country. But where the country is not able to absorb the returning migrants and um, economic possibilities are still limited or being developed, we find out that um, a lot of those people that um, took the route of voluntary returning are finding their way back to Europe, which is not what we want, because we want our young people to stay and develop our economies. So this is something that we want to see in the new agreement going forward, ensuring that we treat migration in a more humane manner and make sure that the interests of both parties are taken on board in the eventual agreement that we, we, we sign off on. I think there's a second question on the human rights implications, which I um, mentioned in my statement. It's a concern for all of us that there are a lot of migrants, thousands of migrants that are standard, stranded in Libya, and most of them are already in the hands of traffickers, forcing them to call their families to um, take money from them and subjecting them to very inhumane conditions. I think we cannot just close our eyes to this. This has, been, has to be something that both sides you know, both um, e, the EU party and third countries have to focus on this to make sure that the human rights of these migrants and also those that have to, uh, are already landed 
in um, the southern borders of Europe are protected. Our worry and our concern is if we focus too much on the issue of uh, returns, um, it will take the dimension of forced returns. And again, even within the EU, that can have a connotation, a connotation among the civil society and, and, um, and, 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 and um, citizens that anybody who is a, you know, a migrant, you have to be forced to return. We have seen incidences where people are asked, when are you going back home? People are working here as um, international civil servants. So these are things that we really have to um, you know, bear in mind when we are talking about the issue of return and integration so that at least it would be more sustainable and a more humane approach is adopted. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Ambassador. Moving on with the panel, uh, Francisco, if you'd like to come in. Yes, uh, hello. Um, I want to first, first of all to refer to a point that Mr. Arhin made, I think, which was very interesting. I think, I mean, he made a number of very interesting points, but there are three points I'll retain. One is the issue of abuse, I will deal with a little bit in a minute. Then return not the solution and development infrastructure, in development infrastructure in the country of origin, so that actually the returnee, on the, with the help of reintegration assistance, can also have opportunities, because otherwise, as Mr. Arkin said, the money might go down the drain. I think the ambassador has already addressed this issue a little bit, but indeed, <clears throat> it is clear to us that uh, without successful cooperation on development as well, and of course, the own investment of the third countries in the or on uh, development and with the, the support of the Commission there, there's also not sustainability, if you want, uh, for, for the funding and investment that will be done in the area of reintegration and voluntary return. So I think both things go hand in hand. That's why the Commission, of course, has a strong interest in signing and finalizing the continental agreement, and also, of course, to continue and uh, strengthening uh, you know, our development funding in, in, in Africa and in the Asian countries in general. Uh, abuse, of course, has no place uh, in our cooperation, in our immigration, in a mutual migration management by third countries and, and the Commission, as well has not, of course, um, a place in the EU itself. And of course, all the provisions need to be <clears throat> monitored by the Commission clearly to ensure that uh, you know, this, the human rights abuses do not happen. Just to look to the questions of the pan of the of the of the participants in the in the webinar, I think Marlene was as, was talking about uh, post Cotonou and prescriptive provisions. I do not think the new provisions of Cotonou are more prescriptive prescriptive than in the past, and I think the ambassador probably will agree on that. It is they are more detailed than in the past because in the past were a little bit vague and actually led to some um, blockages in 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 the area of readmission that I think have to be addressed. And that's our intention. With the, our partner countries to write to find the right formulations to make them a bit more detailed. Article 25 in the report on the level of cooperation of readmission. Whether Marlene was asking whether actually this takes into account the challenges of third countries. Yes, it does because already in the visa code it is clear that uh, uh, in the report uh, we are already looking, of course, at problems of capacity of member of third countries. For example, you know, it is not only enough to have the will, for example, and the and the commitment to as well readmit third country nationals, to readmit their own nationals, but also, of course, the capacity of dealing with the procedures, the capacity as well of working with the EU in these returns. So this is something we looked at, of course, uh, when we we're assessing the level of cooperation. And as well, uh, there are two steps in this process, you know, from moving to the level of cooperation assessment to, to whether the Commission would propose positive or negative uh, measures, you know, or, incentives, uh, positive measures or restrictive measures to a third country, the overall relations uh, with that third country have to be taken fully into account. So they are, of course, the challenges of the third country are, are the opportunity to exist to take into account the challenges, challenges of third countries. I think Jessica was asking about whether the returns will be exacerbating the human rights abuses and whether how to respect human rights. I mean, human rights, of course, are a fundamental element of the Charter, and obviously they are um, included in all our legislation. So the human rights aspects are, of course, the main subject of the return directive, and the asylum procedures regulation, and different asylum key. And uh, clearly, uh, for example, the fundamental uh, principle of non refoulement has to be and is looked after by the national courts and the EU legislation. So I think human rights are going to be always uh, fully protected in the context of the EU. I don't understand what she mentioned. Did she 
refer to the externalization of the EU policies. I don't think the pact includes at all any elements of externalization of EU policies. On the contrary, it's something that has been, I think, has been uh, not pursued and has not been a subject of the EU policies uh, you know, uh, since the beginning. So I don't think this is an issue. Um, and I think what we need to do, because uh, I think Joanna was talking about the obstacles to, what are the obstacles on readmission? As we said, um, I think Mr. Arhin was saying the return is not the solution. And, and I think we fully agree that return is not the solution. The return, return is really a constatation of a failure, if you want, in a way. Yeah? Having said that, the returns are, at the moment, very necessary. And they are very necessary because they are an obligation. And I think we all want African partners and ourselves to be seen as respecting uh, international regulation. I think we all want to be trusted partners in the, in the world scene. And as well, it's an obligation because if this if the returns do not work, it's also very difficult as well to build up the confidence to develop uh, all the aspects of our policy that we have proposed in the past, in the past, such as legal migration, for example. You know, I think I think this is those are really legs of the same table. And when, if, if we work successfully and we cooperate successfully on all these areas, I think we can have a much more positive and I think a mutually beneficiary uh, uh, migration policy. Uh, if you if you took, if you, uh, for example, look at returns, um, you know the level of returns is insufficient. I think the the context of the returns is too complicated. As I said, I think in terms of obstacles, we are addressing a number of obstacles which are uh, related to the own EU procedures. But we also uh, need to make sure that you know returns and readmission become a normal, uh, pro, a normal aspect of our cooperation with third countries. So. In that normal, normalization of this process, I think has to be taken into account the challenges of third countries, as, as the ambassador said, for example, is something, you know, we know that it's not, as I said, a straightforward issue, returns and readmission can, can create political problems, can create socioeconomic problems. So we have to look into this for sure, but it is also, it should also become normal and more fluid that returns happen uh, while actually trying to avoid or minimize these political and socioeconomic consequences. And I think this is what sometimes we're missing. We're missing this normalization of this as one more aspect of migration. And then, as I said, and I finish with this, we have proposed uh, legal migration uh, proposals in the, in the, in the pact. Uh, we have expanded our resettlement possibilities uh, enormously. And, and I think in terms of protection, in terms of legal migration, we want to develop and work together with our African partners on these talent partnerships as well as all the legal migration avenues, which I think can be perfectly mutually reinforced with our uh, overall migration management efforts. Sorry, I have been a little bit long, Olivia, but I thought it was useful to address these issues. Brilliant. Not at all. Thank you very much for that. Um, Krakow, over to you. But before that, just a reminder to all participants that you can continue submitting questions uh, if there's any more you would like to raise, and we will make sure to address them before the end of the event. Over to you. Thank you. Um, yes, I would just quickly um, uh, react to to the 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 the, res the just mentioned comment. I mean, I still insist uh, return is not the solution. Uh, it's a necessity at this time, but it's not the solution at the end. You will have people you return; they will try to come back. Uh, we've seen this happening over and over, and people are here also not on their own as well. We have this. Uh, 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 criminal element to to this whole irregular migration uh, uh, route. People are boarded; they are forced to enter ships and boats from Libya. Just that uh, 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 these criminals will, 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 will be seen to be having something to do and push there in, in these directions against their will. However. I would just go to uh, uh, the question of win-win. Uh, there was a question about um, whether this uh, pact actually brings up win-win situation. Uh, the win-win that is talked about, if it's within the government level um, or for the European win-win for the, the, the hard extreme anti-migrant government and the liberal governments who believe in migration, uh, maybe this pact gives a win-win in that in that line. Perhaps the consideration and the discussions that are ongoing at the moment might lead to some form of a win-win. But what about the migrant in this win-win scenario? Um, I will suggest something here and uh, you, can, you can think about it as well. 
if we want people, uh, I mean, on the continent, one of the challenges uh, that we face is mobilizing uh, uh, funds, you know, resources, uh, loans, easy access to, to financial uh, 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 resources. This is our biggest challenge on the continent, right? Why can't we develop a system where it is easy for the youth to access loans or simple, I'm not talking about microfinancing because that's a whole different aspect. But if the, the EU is happy to support an initiative to actually give access to potential migrants, people who have dreams, who have ideas, who have possibilities to develop something, who are even in their own small, small businesses to improve it and be able to access these kind of financial resources without going through long organizations or, 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 or uh, at international uh, agencies to give them something penny for them to work with and even prescribe the kind of skill they will have to go into, into this but leave people to come up with their own visions and, and imaginations and support these imaginations from wherever you are. That could be one, one, one aspect. And there you can help the, 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 uh, the, the, the potential migrant already with, in, with a win from there. And when they are regular support to help these uh, entrepreneurship and these uh, agencies to grow, then we can talk about uh, winning them. We don't have to wait for them to reach here and then think of giving them enough resources to return because the time with which they leave the country and by the time they come back, there have been so many changes and so much has gone on such that some of them don't even know what is happening on the ground anymore. And that is a, a critical factor. Another aspect of this win-win is the, 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 the trade arrangement, the trade. Uh, uh, we have to talk about comprehensiveness. If these returnees are brought home and they are even investing in, 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 in other activities, and they can produce something, they can come up with some. What is the trade arrangement? Is it fair? Is it just to your equal partners? Is it just to them? It is, is it just to African countries? We have to tackle that one as well. So we want to look at a structure and a system that really works in that aspect. Again, about the human right, I made mention of it. You know, I think that human rights it's, it's not just what we see on paper. It's about what we embody in our actions, even our donations, what we think about other people. It's all part. It can tell how far we will go with respecting the right of that person or not. We hear from extreme right-wing governments, the words that they sometimes use on migrants, the, the kind of tonation, the kind of anger you see from their eyes. And if these are the same politicians and the same government that are supposed to contribute resources and show of providing human rights to migrants, then we have a great cause of concern. And I think the question of whether this pact actually uh, uh, goes deeper into that, it's a question for us all. At the moment, we can defend and say, yes, measures will be put in place. But if these countries are leading these measures, we are yet to see how human rights will be respected in that regard. The last point that I want to uh, uh, react to is the aspect of, of, of political dialogue or the part of political dialogue and agreements that are happening between governments. Governments don't only think of their legitimacy. Governments only don't think about their, 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 uh, their remittances. They also think and look at trust within the systems, because this has been, some of the issues we are discussing is not new because the pact is here. These are issues that have been mentioned over and over. How far have we always tried to take into consideration the, 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 the third or, or home country or country of origin, their perspectives in some of these uh, 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 policies that are developed? I think these are also very important. Return, can help at this moment for the European perspective and for other others who want to uh, uh, please their, their, their electorate. However, 
when we focus on it too much, we are missing the point. That's that's all I want to say. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kraku. Uh, Victoria, the floor is yours. Thanks. In the interest of time, I'll keep this brief. I'll say something on human rights of migrants um, and a little bit of on AVR. Um, on the human rights situation, someone asked, uh, I think Jessica asked, um, how will the new pact uh, exacerbate the human rights situation of migrants? And I think the answer, again, is there's great potential for this to have a negative impact on the human rights of migrants, both upon arrival in Europe, for instance, during the screening process, where it is quite unclear yet how the monitoring really is going to work in practice. There's some voices, um, some indications that the human rights uh, agency FRA is going to do some of the monitoring, but then um, also that in the end, uh, the member states themselves are responsible for monitoring themselves. So basically all of this is quite unclear. I think the quality of the screening process will rise when the transparency in the monitoring rises. Same with human rights after the return of people. Under the current proposal, the country that is responsible for the return sponsorship or that takes that up does not only return people and is responsible for that process, but also for reintegration aid. And I really struggle um, with viewing a country like Hungary, it's always used, you know, Hungary or Austria or all the countries that, you know, tend towards um, return sponsorships or might tend more towards those than towards resettling or relocating them. Um, how they all of a sudden would become very keen on investing in reintegration aid for these people. So I think here again, the devil is in the detail and we'll have to see how that plays out. Um, one point on assisted voluntary return, the question was how can the EU increase the uptake of assisted voluntary return? And the usual answers that are given there are, well, we have to reach out to the potential returnees, we have to give them tailor-made and really individual packages, we have to make sure it's comprehensive from the moment in the country through the actual return process, um, and then do a lot of follow-up with people um, that are in country. And all of that is true. But I'd like to complicate, you know, not complicate that a bit, that sounds terrible. I'd like to just add um, one more kind of inconvenient truth about assistant voluntary return that a lot of actors don't like to talk about. And that is that assistant voluntary return is a great tool in the migration policy toolbox, but it has a limited potential. For the simple reason that the uptake of assisted voluntary return, we see that in study after study, decreases, the motivation to take that up decreases, the more unsafe your home country is, the poorer your home country is, and the more unfree your home country is. So right now we're looking at a lot of countries of origin that are poor, unsafe, or unfree, or, all, or a combination of those things. So obviously the return numbers to those countries um, of assisted voluntary return are not going to go through the roof no matter how great a package you create. And that is why in the end, of course, we should continue to invest in AVR, but we should acknowledge that AVR is a tool that cannot replace deportations, but it simply it can work in parallel to deportations, but not instead of them in all cases. And that, again, it's, it's an inconvenient truth, but it, it remains a fact nonetheless. Um, one more thing I'll add on this, how, what are the problems in actually implementing the readmission agreements and how can the EU implement readmission agreements more? Mm -hmm. I think the main problem that we're facing there is that readmission agreements, signing them, is very much in the interest of the European Union and that's why we have a lot of them. But actually not implementing them is oftentimes in the interest of the countries of origin or delaying the implementation a little bit. And it might not always be that it's not in their interest, but also that they're simply not capable of doing it. But I think it's this kind of divergent interest of signing them interest in the EU, not implementing them is the interest of the um, of country of origin that leaves us with a lot of dead paper. Very last point, I want to absolutely agree with um, Francisco Castillo Mesquides that when he talked about the normalization of return as a necessity. I couldn't agree more. It's something that we've also called upon. Return and deportations are a legitimate and necessary part of a functioning migration and asylum system. But of course, they need a lot of transparency. They need a lot of monitoring. They need training of the people who do them to ensure that human rights are actually protected and that we do and conduct these deportations and the returns along in line with our values. And I think that is where right now we really are not living up 
to our values and not living up to the promise. And I think if we want to keep the legitimacy of the return system, we need to improve the transparency and the monitoring. Thank you very much for those concluding uh, remarks, uh, Victoria. We have one further question from Stephanie Fischler. Um, Stephanie, if you would like to uh, raise that question yourself. Stephanie, I believe you're muted. Okay, um, perhaps I'll, I'll read it out myself. Uh, her question says, one of the amorphous statement uh, says one of the biggest issues in Africa seems to be the lack of capacity, training or knowledge contribution. Outside states and non-state actors seem to only be interested in trade. Um, so more, uh, more of a statement than a question, but more than happy to hear participants, uh, uh, panelists thoughts on that one. Um, and finally, maybe I'll, I'll use my privilege as moderation, um, as moderator uh, to invite the, oh, sorry, we do have one more question before that, actually from Marta Gionko. Uh, Marta, if you would like to uh, raise your question. Right. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Uh, I'm Marta Janka from PICUM. First of all, thank you very much for all the panelists, which are uh, contributions were all very, very interesting. Uh, I would like to just ask a question on alternatives to return, because I think we have been talking a lot about returns, but we do see that a number of member states do have alternative pathways to regularization. For instance, uh, EMN research from 2010 found that more than half of you member states at the time had a temporary permit for medical grounds. And we also know that there are a lot of other permits, for instance, for victims of domestic violence or for children. And I would like to know how you think that these alternatives could be more better promoted to avoid the human rights implications of returns. And in particular, how in the new EU pact, you think that access to these permits could be preserved and encouraged. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Marta, for that question. Um, and I believe we have no more questions. Um, so I will. I was saying before, I will use my privilege as moderator to just bring us back to the initial question with which we started this event, which is, what can we do going forward? It's been very clear from the discussion so far that there's still very different perspectives uh, on the priority given to returns compared to other policy areas versus the necessity of returns for those other policy areas like labor migration to continue progressing as uh, on the EU perspective uh, it, it would be intended. Um, the question that I would like to raise maybe and conclude as a concluding question for all panelists is what can the EU do given this priority that will continue to be given to returns? Uh, what can the EU do to better integrate these other perspectives? Are some of the proposals we've discussed like a focus on voluntary return and reintegration enough? Are there any other policy elements that are new that would be missing there? Um, so more than happy to hear um, panelists' remarks on this uh, and after this round we'll conclude. So um, Madam Ambassador, we'll turn over to you uh, for your final remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. And um, I thank all the, uh, my fellow panelists for the very detailed and interesting discussion on this particular issue. Um, I firstly want to say that we need to focus on the partnership approach. You know, we have said that um, we are partners. It's not a donor-recipient relationship. But that partnership has to be seen to be done in action. And um, this is where the, the part for me you know, deserves um, better action you know, on the side of the EU to ensure that um, African governments, perhaps through the upcoming um, summit, which is um, slated for 2021, we can revisit and try to see third party concerns, how they are taking on board when it comes to the issue of return and the admission. We also need to adopt a very holistic approach. The, all the migration policy documents from Africa talked about the holistic approach. Without um, bearing in mind the developmental issues related to migration, it will be very difficult to have the positive and sustainable impact that we're looking for when it comes to the issue of migration. We also need to bear in mind that um, our countries are at different levels in terms of capacity. I think one of the last speakers mentioned about the issue of capacity constraints in Africa. This is a reality. Our governments, you know, this is the first time that we're trying to develop a migration policy, for example, you know. And then you have to capacitize the various institutions that you have built. The uh, mechanisms in place upon arrival in the, in the third countries are not there. You know, even if they are there, they are not developed to a level wherein we can sustain and make sure that the migrants that return are well catered for within the, the society. And um, I believe um, Dr. Kweku mentioned the issue of skills development. This is a critical need in Africa. There are jobs in Africa, but the human resources don't match the skill sets that are required 
to develop our economies. We need to focus on that. We need to focus on creating the jobs within Africa. We need to make sure that there's industrialization. And this is where the capacity of young people needs to be built in. These are realities. If we, need, we, if we want to make sure that you know, our young people stay in the country, these are issues that have to be focused on. I agree that um, international protocol requires that um, return and readmission is a reality, is a necessity. But it has to be done in such a manner that young people, uh, they themselves take the decision to return in the first place. And we, even where they're forced to return, it is done in a humane manner and in the event that they actually will um, arrive at their destinations, that at least their welfare and um, uh, human rights are, are taken into consideration. And there wouldn't be any need for them to return back to, um, back to Europe. So these are things that I believe we can work on together, the EU and African countries, through the various platforms that are available to us, so that at the end of the day, we arrive at, I'll go back to where I started from, the win-win solutions that we are looking for. I had said that Africa is a youthful um, um, continent, and we need our young people to develop our country. It's a concern for us that these young people prefer to leave using all means possible to them to come to Europe. And uh, migrants are, by their very nature, are people who are very industrious. You know, they, 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 are, they have the drive to develop. So this is what we need to tap into to make sure that at least they use those energies within their countries of origin. I think I would stop there and to thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this very interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us, Ambassador. Um, Francisco, I'll move over to you. Um, in the interest of time, I'd, I'd ask all panelists to please try to keep the concluding remarks as brief as possible. Over to you. Well, I think I would be very, 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 very uh, brief, actually. I think, you know, the solution to all of this is the connectivity between the different policies. So if we really want to make returns work well, we need the development policy to work well. If we need, we want development policy to work. We also need returns to work well. If we want asylum to work well, uh, returns also need to work well. And indeed, I think Mr. Arkin said it is important that, of course, mainly third countries, because it is, of course, their, their job, but with our cooperation and support, we create as well economic opportunities for those who will be returned. This also is also very clear. That's why we have reintegration. Just a little correction. I mean, I, I was very much behind Mrs. Rittig, the return sponsorship uh, idea. So, indeed, there are not, a number of issues that we need to clarify because, of course, not everything has been written in the pack. But the reintegration support will not be, in that case, the responsibility of Hungary. That would be really the EU uh, providing the support for reintegration and, and, and further support after return. The return of sponsorships is more about, let's say, uh, diplomatic support and as well, of course, practical support, identification support and so on and so forth in the country of entry or after eight months in case it is necessary to continue the process of return from the country of destination. Uh, but there are a number of things, I agree, a number of things we need to clarify, and actually we are taking the time over the next weeks and months to clarify these issues of the return responses. But indeed, I think it's the connectivity of the policies. And, uh, and for this, we need the cooperation of third countries. Uh, for me, it is very clear the Commission, the EU, is not blind to the obstacles and challenges that they are confronted with the third countries, but it is also equally important that we, their cooperation is strengthened as well, and their commitment as well to make the migration policy is work uh, with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Krakow, over to you. Thank you all very much. And I, I thank all the questions that came in. They're really, really, really helpful for the discussion. Uh, quickly, I would, there's this scenario that uh, whenever you try to keep something so much from someone, then you give the person more the urgency to, to, to look for it even the more. The more we put attention on return, uh, and, and that we, we, we also create the, uh, the, the, the assumption that because some of these packages that are given alone to someone who didn't migrate is quite a lot of money, all right? Or a lot of, uh, a lot of things in that package. So it goes on and it can even motivate others to take the same, reach there, get this small package and bring it back. If the solution has to be there, let us think of alternative ways to create uh, 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 the, the, the needed structure in the home country. I think that should be where the focus are. And that's why governments, African governments, like I said before, needs to be up and doing. Uh, the Gambian government, I, I know very well, 
you are putting a lot of uh, uh, infrastructures in place. And that's actually very good because also you have a huge number of, 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 uh, of, of migrants as well. And that is very good. However, to conclude, I would say the alternatives to return should continue. I think we have to address Martha's question. These are there. And, my, and also we have to change this preconceived assumption that migrants receive I don't want to even go back home at all forever. No. I mean, even if you stay in Europe, you'll be reminded always to go home. Even if you don't want, if you if you're not planning to go in the next few days or so, they will be you'll be reminded to go. So people want to go, but to go back to what? That is the most important aspect that usually we miss. And so alternative returns should be there on the agenda. People are here who are trapped as well even legally they are trapped but they need this support to go as well we have to put this in place so to thank you all for this wonderful discussion i think it's something we need to keep on doing and i thank the european union at least this pact even though it has so much similarity to what had been happening it is a step forward knowing that we can work together discuss further and provide better solutions thank you Thank you very much for that compelling conclusion. And Victoria, over to you for the final word. Thanks. I'm flattered to have the final words I'm between you and coffee, and I'll keep it brief. Um, what should we do? I want to echo what the PICOM representative um, stated in her question, and that is obviously we don't need to just talk and think about returns, but also about regularization. The two pronged strategy that individual member states have to pursue in the coming years is of course one where returns are considered a what they are, which is a legitimate part of the migration policy toolbox, but it is simply not realistic to presume that everyone who has received an order to return is actually going to return eventually. The numbers simply are talking another language here. We know by looking at the data that it's unrealistic that all these people are going to return. So what we need to also do is put serious thinking behind which groups of people will we give a path out of this legal limbo? Who will we give officially a chance? Because giving that chance is in the interest of the people that are concerned and in the, in the interest of the individual member states. So think about after X number of years, people should be allowed to stay. If they've been paying their taxes, they should be allowed to stay. If they have no criminal record, they should be allowed to stay. This is not rocket science. Every big migration magnet in the world has dealt with these issues before and has found uh, ways out of it. it. Different European countries have had, um, have had regularization campaigns in the past. It is only today that all of this seems to be so difficult because our conversation has turned toxic, but it doesn't have to be that way. We have historical precedent of this. So regularization and return, both necessary and legitimate parts of the answer to the challenges of today. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, Victoria. A lot to think about going forward. Um, I would like to conclude here with apologies for going slightly over time, but I think the discussion was worth it. Um, I hope you agree. Um, I'd like to first thank all excellent panelists for taking the time to join us today. And of course, uh, of course, also all participants for joining this extremely insightful and lively discussion. Um, I think one of the things that has been very clear from the discussion is how impossible it is to disentangle return and readmission from a wide range of other policy spheres. So in that context, I'd like to remind you that our next event on the broader EU Africa cooperation on migration will focus on resettlement that's happening on the 4th of November and invitations and further details will be out shortly. We hope to see you there. Um, the EPC and Madam has done a lot of work on this area, including on returns and readmission cooperation. We invite you to check that out um, and keep following our pages for further work to come in the coming weeks. Thank you all once again for joining. Um, it's been a fantastic discussion. We hope to have you over at the EPC again soon. Many thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you very much, Olivia. Take care, everyone.